Good morning and welcome to worship here at Quincy Point Congregational Church. As always, we are glad that you are worshiping with us this morning, virtually and in spirit. I have a couple of announcements that I would like to share with you this morning. The first is that we have changed the order of worship just a little bit, the one that you received in your email or the one that's pasted on our website. So please uh, just follow along with us as best you can, but don't worry if it's a little changed. Our other announcement is that members of Quincy Point Congregational Church received an email and soon will receive a postal mailing of our annual report and an annual meeting voting form. The instructions are attached, so please read carefully and then fill out your form and send it in as soon as possible. All entries, all votes, are to be into the church office no later than Friday, May 1st. And thank you for participating in our virtual and hopefully only annual meeting. So with those housekeeping items taken care of, let us now settle our hearts and minds and the reason that we are here today, and that is the worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. So come together with me now as we join together in our call to worship. Come and hear the good news of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thought he was dead, but he is risen from the dead and lives evermore. Let us bow down and worship him. Let us bring our praises and joyful hearts to our Lord. Christ wants 
vocation. Loving God, come and speak to our hearts today. May we, like those on the Emmaus Road, find your words burning with hope in our lives. Strengthen us and give us courage for the journey ahead. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us join together in the pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes, especially lately, it seems like our faith life is like a journey in which we discover that we have four flat tires and no roadside service plan. Sometimes, especially lately, it seems like we can't get out of the driveway without the kids yelling, are we there yet? Sometimes, especially lately, it's hard to speak of any kind of journey, even a spiritual one, without also acknowledging that we are all stuck at home, self-isolating, not working, kept from gathering with those we love. Sometimes, especially lately, it seems like our journeys have ended before they've even begun. Lord, help us get through this. Please be with us on all of these journeys, even the ones that don't seem to go anywhere. Bring us hope and comfort. Remind us that all will be well, and that we will be okay, and that you, O oh God, are walking with us. This week, so many things have happened in our lives. Some of these things have been wonderful and cause our hearts to rejoice. Other things have torn at our spirits, seeking to bring us down. Lift us up, Lord. Open our eyes to you. Help us to see your presence in all your world. Give us courage and strength for all the journeys ahead so that even flat tires and fussing children will not deter us from our destination. And hear us at this time, as we, together apart, lift up the names of those we hold dear, the situations close by and far off that cause concern, and yes, hear us as we pray even for our own needs. Hear us now as we pray. Now, O oh God of all journeys, hear us as we repeat the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
of distress and anguish. Saying, 
stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while Jesus was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures for us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what had happened on the road, and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God add this blessing to his reading, to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Amen. Please now join me in prayer. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know if you have ever noticed, but I am short. I know, shocker. Anyone else out there similarly afflicted? As a vertically challenged individual, I have created coping skills and strategies to help me navigate a world geared to the needs of the taller and larger. Can't reach an item on the top shelf at the supermarket? I have a pretty good throwing arm and decent aim, and with a knowledge of basic geometry and physics, I can fling a random object at what I need deflecting said item and waiting into my tiny waiting hands. Going to the theater? I always snag the aisle seat because inevitably a giant wall of meat will plunk himself or herself down in front of me, obstructing my view. An aisle seat allows me to angle myself so I'm not completely blocked. It's not perfect, but it works, and I don't cause problems for the person behind me as I dodge and weave trying to get a better view. Short people out there, y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? There are times, in spite of my best coping skills and strategies, that what I need is out of reach. Despite my best aim and deflection angle, despite geometry and physics, despite my request for the tall and the large of this world to give me an unobstructed view, I am kept from getting what I want I'm seeing what I need to see. It's annoying, it's exhausting, and as much as I am tired of this saying, it is what it is. I share my woes with you because as I was reading today's gospel lesson from Luke, I was struck by the phrase, their eyes were kept from seeing him, and it reminded me of everything I do to not be kept from seeing. In my case, it's a fairly simple explanation as to how I am literally kept from seeing. But in the case of the two walking the Emmaus Road, it's not so clear. Their eyes were kept from seeing. Why? Luke doesn't tell us much about these men, just that they were two average guys deeply saddened by the events surrounding the crucifixion and the death of their rabbi, Jesus and mightily confused by the strange stories told by some women three days after Jesus was buried. Luke begins his story by telling us that these guys just wanted to go home. They needed to go back to familiar territory where they could safely wrestle, wrestle with the burden of their broken hearts. Luke tells us the name of one of them, Cleopas, but doesn't bother naming the other. The story implies that they were pretty open and friendly dudes. After all, they invited an oddly familiar stranger to walk with them, stay with them at the inn, and break bread with them. 
And that's pretty much all we know. Luke doesn't give us any hints as to why they couldn't see. Are they short? Do they have bad eyesight? Or some kind of crossbow bagnosia, a legitimate facial recognition disorder called face blindness. What do we know about them is helpful, but it doesn't tell us why they were kept from recognizing Jesus. Because the whole Emmaus Road story rests on that premise, doesn't it? There's no Emmaus Road if Cleopas and his buddy were all like, hey, look, it's Jesus. Cool. How's it going? And it's not as though they didn't know what he looked like. Of course they knew what he looked like. They were stopped, prevented from recognizing. They were kept from seeing. So we have to ask not only the why, but also by what or by whom. And doesn't that raise a host of uncomfortable questions? For example, did Jesus prevent them from recognizing him? Did he do so in order to, I don't know, make a point? Have permission to call them morons for not understanding the resurrection because, you know, he kind of did in Luke's story. Did he stop their eyes so he could have an overly dramatic ta-da moment, which is a terribly mean and juvenile prank to pull? on two followers clearly grieving your death. Not to mention that if it was an act of deliberate obfuscation on Jesus' part, what does it say about their and our relationship with him? I mean, if someone intentionally prevented me from understanding or purposefully stopped me from seeing something and then publicly scolded me for not understanding or not seeing the thing that was deliberately hidden from me, I would feel really hurt and terribly betrayed. The foundation of our friendship broken, relationship crumbling until there was really nothing left upon which to stand. Yeah, I don't see Jesus doing that, really. I don't see that happening. During his earthly life, Jesus did everything that he could do to illuminate, not confuse. If anything, our relationship with and to Jesus exposes hidden truths about ourselves and pushes us into greater understanding of who and whose we are and what we are called to be because of our relationship with him. So no, I don't think it was Jesus who kept these two from recognizing him. And ditto with God and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't make sense to me that both God and the Holy Spirit would deliberately keep heartbroken, frightened, and struggling people from seeing. What would be the purpose? What would they have gained by that? So then, if it's not an external prohibition, then maybe it is an internal prohibition, keeping them from truly seeing who Jesus is. Maybe they themselves have inadvertently caused their own Christ blindness. Obviously, they didn't mean to prevent themselves from seeing Jesus. We never mean to not see what we need to see, or not to know what it is that we need to know, especially regarding that which is sacred and important to us. Unfortunately, we seldom know what we've missed out on until after it's happened. We don't know that we have kept ourselves from seeing until we are jolted into clarity of vision, until the scales fall from our eyes and we can see. In an Easter letter written a few years ago to the Episcopal churches of the Massachusetts Diocese, the Bishop Alan Gates told a story that best explains what happens when we cannot recognize the sacred because of what we do or do not do. Near the end of C.S. Lewis's book, The Last Battle, the final story in his Chronicles of Narnia, a group of surly dwarves is huddled together in a tight circle. The dwarves have been thrown in by their enemies through a door into what they believe is a dark, smelly stable. In truth, the doorway has led to a lush countryside where the grass is greener than green, the sky bluer than blue just the sort of place that New Englanders have been fantasizing about for the past month. 
Nearby, the golden lion Aslan stands with the other dwarves and the children who bury their faces in Aslan's mane and receive his gentle nuzzling. But the little group of ill-tempered dwarves sits apart, willfully oblivious to the beauty around them. They had a very odd look, the book says. They weren't strolling about or enjoying themselves, although the cords by which they had been tied seemed to have vanished, nor were they lying down and having a rest. They were sitting very close together in a little circle, facing one another. They looked around, neither looked around nor took notice. Look out, said one of them in a surly voice. Mind where you're going in this pitch black, pokey, smelly little hole of a stable. Are you blind, said someone. Ain't we all blind in the dark, said the dwarf. But it isn't dark, you poor stupid dwarf, said Lucy. Can't you see? Look up, look around. Can't you see the sky and the trees and the flowers? Can't you see me? How in the name of all humbug can I see what ain't there? And how can I see you any more than you can see me in this pitch darkness? Starting a new lie, trying to make us believe we're none of us shut up, and it ain't dark, and heaven knows what. You see, said Aslan, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief, their prison is only in their minds, yet they are in that prison, and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. So then, what prison of the minds prevented Cleopas and his friend from seeing Jesus? The prison of fear, for one, for they were greatly afraid. Afraid of the authorities, afraid that they had spent years following Jesus and for what? Afraid of what their future may or may not hold. The prison of busyness. For they were hurrying home and the vigilance employed by the act of walking along the Emmaus Road prevented them from truly thinking about what they had seen and heard. The prison of hopelessness and despair. The prison of anger. What other prisons do you think afflicted them? And do these prisons sound uncomfortably familiar to you? Are they, in fact, the same kinds of prisons that afflict you and me? Because aren't we, too, a lot like Cleopas and that unnamed companion? Aren't we, too, more often than not, held prisoner by what happens within ourselves, our minds and our hearts, rather than by external forces. Aren't we too, like Cleopas and that unnamed companion, forever traveling towards something so hard that we forget to see where we've been? And perhaps, just perhaps, Cleopas's companion remains unnamed because Luke wants us to see ourselves as her, as him, as them, as that unnamed traveler who walks with Cleopas down that road that hopefully ends with an encounter with the Risen One. But that encounter with the Risen One, that depends a lot on us, doesn't it? That encounter depends upon what we are willing to give up, to let go of, and to reject. That encounter depends on how we see that Emmaus Road and all who travel upon it. That encounter depends upon us walking out of the prisons of our own making into the greener than green pastures, the bluer than blue skies of endless heaven, into the warm, light, and eternal love of Jesus Christ. So again, what prisons hold us back? These days, it kind of feels like our own homes are prisons because of self-isolation, but that's really not what I'm getting at. I'm talking about the emotional, mental, and spiritual prisons we create. Prisons such as anger and fear, disappointment. What prisons of self-loathing and judgment, prisons of fatigue and hopelessness and despair do we create for ourselves? What are our prisons? What have we inadvertently kept ourselves from seeing? The thing is, 
We may be keeping ourselves from seeing. We may be locked in, lost in prisons and in darkness of our own making, but Jesus is always there, shining bright, calling our names, and holding the keys. What opened the doors for Cleopas and his friends was recognizing Jesus in the breaking of the bread, the burning of their hearts when he spoke to them. What will open the doors for you? For all of us. What will allow the light of Christ to enter into those dark places that have separated you and me, all of us, from him? What do you see, feel, hear, or sense? What do you know of that deep place of knowing that pulls and pushes at you, tugs you into a new place of being? A place that makes you go, aha! Or a place that makes you go, ta-da! Or makes you finally understand that you aren't being kept from seeing because of your size or lack thereof. What makes you drop everything and run back to your friends and say, you'll never guess what happened to me. I saw Jesus. He came to me. Let me tell you what I saw. And let me help you recognize him too. That is so wicked awesome. Amen. And now our benediction for our service this morning. It's time to go, my friends. Set your foot on the path of service and reconciliation. Look for the many ways in which God has blessed your journey, no matter what journey it is. Go forward in confidence and faith that Christ Jesus walks with you every step of the way. Amen.